So check that out. Look at that. <laughs> that dent. Uh, the front panel is not good. I don't have any major complaints. We're back with another pre-built review. This is, to memory, the first main gear system we've looked at, at least in an extremely long time. This was $1,700, and it's called the Vibe. That's the name, V-Y-B-E. So we're looking at the main gear Vibe, a $1,000, $700 system with a 3060 Ti and a 5600X. This puts it pretty up there against the likes of the Alienware R10 and the Skytech Kronos that we reviewed previously. If the Alienware box is anything to go on, this is this is lazy and cheap. There's there's only room to improve. So let's get started with the main gear vibe and see what $1,700 gets us on today's market. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Tower 100. Thermaltake's Tower 100 is a mini ITX case to serve as a showcase system for your components. The Tower 100 has received many revisions since we first saw it, and the case now has an open vent in the bottom for intake, a mesh cutout in the side panel for some GB ventilation, and additional mesh along the side skirts and the side panels of the case. The Tower 100 is mostly focused on building a showpiece PC that's small enough to fit on most tables. Learn more at the link in the description below. Some quick info, as usual, we have the link to the playlist in the description below. We buy all these pre-built ourselves for this series of reviews, and we try to do it as anonymously as possible. We've gotten pretty good at it, and that allows us to buy these systems without the manufacturer knowing so they can't just happen to build the best possible one and have a lot of people look at it before it goes out the door. This has led to us receiving systems with uh, an odd array of problems. For example, oh, here's some rolling screws. Wow, that's crazy. I'm thinking that's not supposed to be making that noise. Is that visible? And that's what allows us to see the real customer experience. As always, if you want to support our ability to continue dumping tons of money into these to figure out which ones are actually worth your time to buy or recommend to friends, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab things like our GN Coaster Pack, which is just about in stock. It's on back order, if not in stock already. We'll be shipping within the next couple of weeks. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab them. It's a four pack of component coasters that we designed in-house using 3D software and we're extremely happy with the result. They've been selling like crazy, so uh, people seem to like them. So you can grab those, that supports us and buying more of these as well. All right, so this is in the upper echelon. We have a couple of super high-end systems coming in for review as well. There's a $5,000 one we bought. It hurt a little bit, especially because it doesn't look like it's gonna be good, but that's news for another time. And this one will be competing most directly with the MSI Aegis R that we just looked at, the Skytech Kronos, and then the Alienware R10 as the last one. So. Let's get started with the teardown. I don't think I'm gonna be too negative about this one, but uh, the case to me, is it's, it's an obvious point that Patrick and I both did not like because it is so constrained and restricted with airflow that it's just sort of uh, hampering otherwise what looks to be a fairly standard and straightforward PC build. Internally, and this is the reason I do have a little bit of hope for this one not being too negative like some of the others, internally it looks very standard. None of these parts are proprietary. They're all standard form factor. The video card standard, the cooler is standard, and it's not stock. So uh, Main Gear, despite having such a garbage tier front panel on their case, has put in two fans in the front and then has a normal tower cooler. So this is promising at least. That can compensate as long as the CPU is not running too hot, like the, uh, the MSI system where they're running at like 250 watts for no reason on the CPU. Anyway, it looks promising. Uh, externally is the only real flaws I've seen so far. Let's get this panel off too. And just to be clear, as always, this has already been through all of our testing processes. And now is the first time we're going to be taking it apart. Okay, so internally, first of all, we're working on the GN mod mat, which you can grab on store.gamersaccess.net if you'd like to get one of our PC building work surfaces. They are anti-static conductive as well to help out with that aspect. So internally, the biggest thing I'm seeing right away is that the cables are really cleanly managed and it's not, we have seen system integrators manage cables well before. CyberPower, for example, did a great job managing its cables while colossally screwing up everything else uh, to do with the thermal solution. They were running at 100 degrees Celsius feet, don't recall. But anyway, they've done well there. Some of the others have too. Okay, starting with the actual disassembly here, we're gonna go with getting the video card out first. So this is, the NVIDIA uh, Founders Edition design. 
which means it's running the 12 pin header that's fed from uh, an eight pin further down. Okay, that would be the FE 3060 Ti. We've looked at this card separately if you're curious what we think about it for the, the thermal design. So won't really be going over that today. That's not up to main gear anyway. I'm seeing some basic heat sinks here on the chipset and over here on the uh, left side of the VRM. Nothing on the top side where I'm looking down here though. So internally, just a quick look around now that everything's disconnected. There's two fans up front. These are 120s. Uh, we're going to talk in the thermal section how all this does. Obviously, it is completely choked off on the front. It's got some side intake. Unfortunately, no side intake here, so they're only leveraging one side. This entire side of the fan is basically doing nothing. So that's, that's pretty unfortunate to see. And it's not going to help with dust management either because there's not a filter in there at all, which maybe we'll look at in a minute when I take the front panel off. Uh, one fan in the back. Now, interestingly, this fan is actually going to act less as exhaust and almost more as an additional intake because uh, the, the pressure up front is going to be so poor from how restricted these are that this fan and this fan both are going to end up pulling more air in from up here than they will from up front. So the only reason this will really do okay in, in thermal testing is because there's no exhaust here. If you buy this system and then you go and add exhaust fans up here, in most situations, it's going to make it worse. We've shown that in the past in benchmarks for case reviews. Not going to bother showing it again here today because we've done this test a million times now. But uh, just be aware that adding exhaust fans in the top, yes, heat rises, but you, know, you start screwing with the pressure system when it's basically uh, these, are, these are pulling air in from the top anyway, and it's going to get worse. And you can think of it this way too. Now, any air coming in from here, whatever there is, will just exit immediately as it's pulled through an exhaust. So don't add fans there as, as exhaust. Intake would do very well though. But you don't. You maybe want a dust filter. Oh wow, that is very on there. I'm just gonna leave the fan behind here. Evac the rest of the system, okay. So that's what I want to point out right there. Look at that. What the hell happened here? Wow, that is super bent. So check that out. Look at that. <laughs> that dent. I don't think that's shipping damage. There's no damage to the top panel, and the box has no damage on it. There's a ton of foam around this part. There's like, an, like two or three inches of foam right here. Really don't think that's shipping to us. It might have been shipping to main gear, but that's actually more of a problem if it went out the door like this. Or they just installed it improperly. What the hell happened? Wow, man. Why is it so banged up? <laughs> All right, well, so the case is really where we're seeing the only issue so far. Let's take a look at the back and then we'll look at the motherboard. So on the back side, cable management is pretty good once again. It's tied down with either zip ties or with Velcro. So they've done pretty well to carry through this theme of managing their cables. So genuinely, Mangear has done a very good job on the cable management. Generally, overall good attention to detail, but still not happy with some of the defects in, like in the case. And then uh, the front panel is not good. Let's take that off, actually. Let's take a look at that. So fairly yeah, old approach where you put the headers in the front panel and then run all the wires through the case. Not the best way to do it, but that's all right. They're doing it because they've, they've decided to attach their LEDs to the front panel instead of the chassis, so they need to run a wire for that. So then at some point it becomes like, a, well, we might as well just run wires for everything. So anyway, that's what they've done there. So looking at the other components here, this is an AMD system as a reminder. And so it's going to be PGA. For the memory, they have sold us HyperX Fury DDR4. Okay, we're going to check the... <laughs> Don't you love AMD? So here's the... the... Pins are fine, by the way. That's why you go straight up if you do that. Uh, all right. Anyway, so just to kind of explain this for you, ideally, you wiggle the cooler like this before you take it off, and it's no problem at all. You just twist it, and it'll break the bond, and you pull as you twist. The reason I pull straight up on these pre-belts 
is I'm trying to not disturb the paste pattern so that I can evaluate if they've competently applied the paste. So as soon as I start twisting it, I can't tell anymore if they got an even spread. Um, sometimes the CPU gets sucked out with the cooler, and then now you can't tell anyway. So unfortunately, we're back to where I'm going to have to move it back and forth. A little heavy, but not bad. I would prefer them to go heavy than to go too light. The motherboard is a B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi model from MSI. It's not a particularly high-end board. Uh, I think that covers all the core components. What did I want to look at? Yes, you. Power supply, thank you. So the last thing to look at is going to be the power supply, which is an EVGA model. I can see that from here. There we go. It's an EVGA 500BR model, and it's 80 plus bronze. That is the nastiest looking representation of the color bronze I've ever seen. It's like almost orange. It's like 80, 80 plus mud brown, 80 plus sewage waste. The new standard from from clear result. Max output is 20 amps on the 5 and 3.3, 3, and then it's 41.7 on the 12 volt, uh, which is actually the full 500 watt supply, so that's actually great to see. Uh, you're not going to need that, but it does mean you're not going to get a, an OCP trip when it feels like it shouldn't happen, which would definitely happen on something like a Dell system where you're at half the total supply in 12 volt. Okay, so I think we can stop there. This is this is fairly standard. I don't have any major complaints. The there's some quality control issues on this case damage up on the top here. The case itself, you know how we feel about it. Uh, that's more of a part selection thing. But in terms of build quality, ignoring the case choice, the kale management was great. The components were installed correctly. Everything was tight and torqued down correctly. Nothing was over torqued that we found. The cables were plugged in correctly and not loose. Uh, and some of these more finicky cables, like the RGB ones, were secured with electrical tape as well. So not really seeing any major problems, but I'm seeing a lot of good attention to detail where they're preempting these surprises or these pitfalls that SIs typically run through when they're shipping out systems. Some really weird... Okay, well, anyway, really, there's just some weird damage I wasn't expecting there, but it's not visible ever, so it doesn't matter. So that's going to be it for the teardown. We're going to move forward with some testing now and see how it does thermally in games and everything else. Let's look at some benchmarks. We'll start off with our game testing suite. We've intentionally limited Cyberpunk 2077 to an older version for test consistency, so overall performance will improve with updates in terms of absolute numbers, but the scaling between systems on the chart remains accurate. On paper, the Vibes 3060 Ti puts it near the top of the chart for comparing specs with the other pre-builds we've reviewed. That'd be below the Skytech Kronos with its RX 6800 and on par with the Alienware Aurora. At 1080p, the Vibe ran at nearly the same average FPS as the Alienware R10, but it did manage a 4.5% uplift. There are a few reasons for that, like, for example, Main Gear's memory is clocked to 3600 instead of Dell's 3200, and the 5600X in the Main Gear system has a higher 3.7 GHz base clock and an identical 4.6 GHz boost clock. And that's in comparison to Alienware's OEM exclusive R7 5800. Remember, that's not a 5800X, so the power characteristics are actually about the same as a 5600X. At the same time, the $1,700 price we paid for the Vibe is also significantly lower than what we paid for the $1,810 Alienware, and it's embarrassingly lower than the $1,750 Aegis R as well. The Vibe outperformed the Aegis by a full 30% in average FPS because of MSI's lower tier 2060 Super GPU, and that's not to speak of the the rest of the system, which was incompetent for other reasons, like the thermals. Theoretically, the Aegis could make up for some of that gap in the CPU department, but we aren't seeing a CPU bottleneck in this test. Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p tells a similar story, with the Vibe achieving a 9% advantage over the Alienware Aurora. Main Gear's 1% and 0.1% lows don't show the same uplift. The system's advantage disappears when going deeper than overall FPS average. But since the GPU is the same, that all makes sense. 
the vibe remains extremely strong when taking the price we paid into account. The MSI Aegis was purchased in the same approximate time frame as was the Asus GL10DH, but the Aegis offers much worse performance for the money with the Vibe 36% ahead in this test. Rainbow Six Siege is the least graphically intensive game in our pre-built test suite, making it more of a CPU test in many instances. The Aegis R still fell behind the Vibe's 3060 Ti, which earned Main Gear's system a 38% advantage over MSI's at 351 FPS average, and that's in spite of the higher price for MSI. The Alienware Aurora stuck to its usual spot, with the Main Gear system coming in 3% ahead, but better in just about every other way like using a normal person motherboard and not whatever this is, or this stock cooler on an $1,800 computer. At 1440p, the main gear and Alienware systems are finally on equal footing with a decisive GPU bottleneck canceling out the Vibe's other advantages. At 232 FPS average for the Vibe and 233 for the Aurora, and combining that with extremely similar 1% and 0.1% lows, the two systems perform functionally identically in this test. GPUs are usually the limiting factor for gaming performance in pre builds and the higher the render resolution, obviously the truer that becomes. We have limited data for Three Kingdoms Battle Benchmark since we only started running it on pre-built systems, but the Vibe is still 35% of the Aegis R, in line with the rest of the game benchmarks that we have more complete data recorded for. We'll add to this one more as more pre-builds come in. We kept thermal testing very simple for the Vibe. Main Gear didn't make any obvious customizations to the power plan, so we verified that there were no significant differences in CPU temperature between balanced and high-performance plans, and then we moved forward with the high-performance plan for testing as usual. With the combined CPU and GPU torture test running on the stock system, CPU T-Die reached steady state at 67 degrees Celsius. Removing the front panel reduced that to 61 degrees, but we need to look at RPM to see how that changed. At the same time, the baseline average GPU temperature of 74 degrees Celsius was reduced to 71. Because we perform very basic testing on pre builds as they ship without controlling for the fan speeds, we need to examine the RPM readings as well to get the full story, which we'll do next. As it is, we can see that the CPU temperatures are well within the acceptable range for AMD, kept low mostly by the 120 mm Cooler Master tower with conventional front to back airflow patterns. It's definitely a step up from the stock cooler. GPU temperatures are warm, but well within range on the die. There was a negligible change in frequency for either the CPU or the GPU between tests, which leaves temperature and fan RPM as the two main variables for us to examine. The case contains three fans, not counting the CPU or GPU coolers. The front fans are marked 1000 RPM and max out at almost exactly that speed, while the rear fan is RGB and maxes out between 1400 and 1500 RPM. If the front fans are connected to the fan hub, they will always run at 1000 RPM, no matter what software settings are chosen. These are the slowest and quietest fans in the case, so it's not a huge deal, but it's a waste of the fan hub's potential. The two fans that do alter speed based on temperature, that'd be the CPU and the rear exhaust fans, are both set to max out when the CPU hits 75 degrees Celsius. The CPU never reached that temperature in our testing, so the fans never achieved their maximum speeds, which is mostly a good thing for noise reasons. Both fans max out at approximately 2000 RPM, and that's as measured by our external tachometer to make sure we're getting accurate readings with lab equipment instead of just relying on software. Examining GPU fan RPM over time, it's clear that taking the front panel off enables lower speeds and gets to a controlled steady state quicker. Stock, it took 52 seconds from the beginning of the load period for the GPU fans to rise above their 30% minimum duty cycle, but that rose to 70 seconds with the front panel removed. Without it, the GPU can stay cooler for longer without increasing fan speeds. Despite the non-adjustable front fans, the system had a very quiet 31.8 dBA idle noise level at our usual 20 inch distance. The maximum steady state noise level we observed was 38.9 dBA, which is also among the quietest systems we've recorded. Again, the CPU and the GPU fans weren't forced to spin at max speed because temperatures remained low enough under load. So there's still some headroom for the fans to spin faster and get louder with an ambient temperature higher than our testing environment. For power consumption with a CPU only blender workload, the Vibe drew 149 watts from the wall for a few seconds before quickly dropping to a stable 138 watt average. That puts it on par with the 10400F equipped ABS Challenger and the ASUS GL10DH with its 3700X, both of which are generally lower performance CPUs than the 5600X, except the 3700X has an advantage in multi-threaded workloads and better efficiency in Blender. The Vibe's gaming performance does come at the cost of higher power draw, but that's 
better than having higher power draw for no good reason, which we've also seen. In Rainbow Six Siege, average full system power draw was 341 watts, only a little bit lower than the higher scoring Skytech Kronos is 349 watts, but also lower than the lower scoring Aegis R's 345 watt average, which again, was a worse computer for FPS as well. Time to talk about setup. The Vibe was tightly packed. The two expanding foam packs were used inside the case with a third outside for good measure. It's more than we typically see. You do have to be careful though in removing them to not snag a cable. The system received little shipping damage and we prefer this extreme to the opposite of not packing it properly, which we've also seen. But there wasn't an absence of damage to the case in general, as you saw in the teardown. The removable top filter was pushed down slightly when we received the system, and removing it revealed that the top radiator tray is bent. This may have happened in shipping, but given how carefully packed it was, we think it most likely happened during assembly. The quick start guide provided with the system contains labeled photographs of the model we bought rather than the generic renders, and that's another extra touch that's a serious value at. The clearer the instructions, the less likely an uninformed customer is to call support. So it's good for everybody. The back of the system has an alphanumeric Windows key on it. This is actually unusual among the pre-builds we received recently. And this is helpful when reinstalling Windows. But hopefully that won't be necessary with the Vibe because Main Gear has installed zero of its own program. If you do end up wanting a clean install, there's a 32 gigabyte recovery flash drive in the accessory kit, which is awesome. We'll continue to call this out every time we see it because it's one of the most helpful extra touches that a manufacturer can provide for a pre-built computer. RGB connections are handled by the combined fan and RGB hub. The WIF MB switch on the board toggles between the motherboard RGB control, or main gear's chosen default, and control via an included wireless remote. The switch has nothing to do with fan speeds. The front panel contains a generous three USB 3.0 type A ports and one USB type C port, the only type C port on the system, as well as separate mic and headphone jacks. No mouse or keyboard is included with the Vibe. A cheap pack and mouse and keyboard combo is arguably less necessary for a mid-range pre-built than for budget ones, since customers are more likely to bring their own peripherals, but it's something to be aware of. On to BIOS and software briefly. The boot drive pre-installed in the Vibe is a dirt cheap Intel 660p NVMe SSD, an identical model to the one in the ASUS GL10DH that we reviewed recently and complained about. As with the ASUS system, we noticed massive drops in speed after only a few seconds of transferring large files to the drive, down to about 40 megabytes per second, which is unbearable if you're moving gigabytes. The drive works perfectly during normal operations like booting or playing games, but beware that moving larger files, more than a couple gigabytes, from a high-speed other drive will bog the entire system down. High speed is key here. Our external drive, the crucial one, typically moves files at 500 to 600 megabytes per second. We aren't storage reviewers, but Anantech covered these SSDs several years ago, the internal 660p that is, and concluded that most normal use cases won't overwhelm the SLC cache and trigger the problem, even with gigabit internet speeds. The extremely high Amazon review score seems to support that this isn't a problem for most people, but we noticed the impact and it's extremely frustrating. Mangear did remember to apply XMP, which is great. They put the two eight gigabyte DDR4-3600 sticks at the rated speed. Memory was set to a one-to-one -one ratio with M clock, U clock, and F clock, all running synced at 1800 megahertz, which is perfect. That's exactly what they're supposed to do. BIOS settings were otherwise unremarkable. The MSI B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi is a retail motherboard rather than a Mangear exclusive, which is good because that is a normal MSI support page with regular updates. And finally, the pre-installed NVIDIA driver was 496.49, which was brand new at the time we ordered our system. So they're using the newest available option. There was also a 3D Mark benchmark result on the drive dated a month prior to our order, implying that Main Gear did some pre-system testing before the PC was finally packaged and shipped out the door. For $1,700 then, just strictly against the other pre-builds we've looked at, ignoring the DIY market for a moment, the Vibe ends up actually with the 3060 Ti being very competitive. The attention to detail by Main Gear makes it look like people who have actually built computers built it, so that's good. Uh, you know, companies like Dell have certainly perfected mass production and assembly lines, but then you get the computer, you're like, there's, there's not a lot of basic problems normally, like for example, all the cables are plugged in, but then you look at the computer and the end result is sort of just like, what the f happened? And that's for all the usual reasons we've complained about, like the fact that most of the parts in those large OEM pre-builds are not upgradable. 
So you got motherboards that are just e-waste the minute they leave the special chassis that they've shipped in, which is also e-waste, because the motherboard has left the chassis. So you just end up with a system that's not really able to be carried forward. That's where companies that are called SIs or system integrators like Main Gear, IO Power, Cyber Power are supposed to step in because they typically, almost always, buy off-the-shelf parts. They should get at least wholesale or distributor pricing that you won't get. So in theory, you're not paying too much of a markup. Depends on the brand, though. And, uh, and then you get something that's more sustainable. You can actually swap the parts yourself if something dies in the future. That's where SIs add value, even though a company like Dell or uh, HP might be able to undercut a little bit on price. They typically do it by building garbage. So you do get what you pay for with those. So this one was far better than the MSI and ASUS systems we looked at for really not too distant prices. A lot better than those. It does start at the higher end, but the pricing is not bad compared to the other $1,800-ish computers we've looked at. This is, this is by far way better than some of the others we've named here. SkyTech is the closest competitor to it. So our largest complaint with the Vibe is still the case design. We've been over this enough now. I'm not going to recap it. Uh, Main Gear has managed to compensate enough that it's not, it's not throttling, like we see with some of the other systems, like CyberPowers, where they're just throttling. There's, that's totally unacceptable. Here it's not throttling, but it could run quieter with lower fan speeds if Mangear would only perforate the panel a little bit more. So that's where Mangear can improve here. Uh, there's some damage to the chassis as well we talked about. They could improve there, maybe some better QC out the door. Uh, we don't think it's a shipping issue, but that could be resolved as well. Overall, though, we were, we're, we're happy to finally have another system that we can put on the, we'd probably recommend this list, if not outright recommendation. So, so far, out of the, I don't know, eight to 10 pre belts we've reviewed recently. That gives us the ABS Challenger with the mesh front that we liked, the SkyTech Kronos that we relatively liked, and then this one, also relatively good, where the shortcomings are superseded by the positives on it. And Main Gear does seem like more of a company that would listen than one that would just continue blaming consumers and then try to sell them warranties that are basically perpetual. So hopefully, Mangear continues to improve on something that's already a very good platform. So uh, the short of it is that if you're looking to recommend a system for a friend, then at least this one seems like it's competently built. It is overall fine to good. And the pre-configured software, the BIOS, uh, small touches like including a USB key with the option to install your own OS very easily, including the license code as well, very accessible. All of that is awesome to see. Really good uh, use of being a system integrator. That's the whole point, is to make it easier to deal with stuff. And Main Gear has done that. So good job, Main Gear. You've passed the test. And uh, this one ends up on the list of now three. We'll see if we can find some more. Come back, as always, for more of these. Go to store.gamersaccess.net or patreon.com slash gamersaccess to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.